Okay, so I think we should go ahead and get started. Uh, Dr. Kornbluth, uh, take it away. So thank you, Peter. Thanks everyone for um, <coughs> logging on. Um, we've had very good feedback. We really appreciate all the questions you've sent in. Uh, we're gonna address as many as we can. At the end of this presentation, I promise Peter, we're not gonna go on, uh, on and on and on as long as we have in the past. There's already close to 400 people on this call. Um, and as with the prior two, uh, they're posted on the uh, New York Gastroenterology Associates website, which I believe is www.gastroenterologist New York. But if you go to New York Gastroenterology Associates, uh, it'll bring you there. And uh, we're going to head off talking about IBD COVID and the COVID-19 vaccine. IBD meaning inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's and colitis, but because there's so much new information since the last time we spoke which was December 23rd, uh, a little bit over a month ago, it really seems like the world has shifted uh, and in constant flux. So we're gonna update first with general COVID vaccine information. I also wanna take this chance to uh, introduce what will be our next webinar. And I'll give you the exact date, which will be February 4th, with really a wonderful, truly spectacular nutritionist who we work with February 10th, and it's February 10th, the care and feeding of your gut microbiota. Probably the most asked about question in a gastroenterologist's office is what could I eat, what should I eat, how does it affect my microbiome? And Tamara Freuman, if you want to look up, look her up on Amazon, she's already written a couple of very uh, well-published books there. Uh, she's absolutely terrific. So that will be February 10th uh, at 8 p.m. So I'm gonna head right off into this. And for those of you who just wanna hear the uh, COVID vaccine updates and don't care to uh, stay for the Crohn's and colitis portion, we're gonna start with the COVID vaccine information and I'll uh, sort of tip you off when it's time to move on. So this is the coronavirus, a photograph. I'm just putting this picture up because it's a pretty picture of this dreaded virus. And we're going to talk about uh, in great detail, the spike protein, because that's really where the universe is centered in terms of uh, the vaccines and also in terms of the variants, which we're hearing about. So what everybody wants to know, and this has changed a great deal since December 23rd and a great deal since January 23rd, literally, uh, the questions I think we all have and that I'll try to address is who can get the vaccine today, January 28th, and it's gonna change literally day by day, week by week, which one should you get? And let me answer that straight up. Moderna or Pfizer, the data we have is that they have virtually dead on effectiveness at 94 or 95%. And in terms of safety, they are identical. And we'll talk about the safety in a little while in that we are not finding new safety signals after 32 million people. We're all hearing about how hard it is to get these vaccines. And the buzzword is vaccines into arms, but they've already gone into 32 million arms. Only a small percentage of those actually have gotten both vaccines. But which one should you get? You should get the one you can get. And we'll talk about that uh, in a few minutes. Where can you get it? We'll talk about that as well. Should I be concerned about safety? And the take home message and, and one of my patients, I only mentioned him by first name, Ryan said, you know, the last talk was pretty good, but just went on and on and on. So why don't you give us the cliff notes up front? So the cliff notes is, should I be concerned about safety? We are not finding safety signals that we didn't see in the first two trials, which was 44,000 patients in the Pfizer trial, 30,000 patients in Moderna. Half of them got placebo, half of them got drug. So if you do the math, it's 74,000 divided by three. You had 37,000 patients monitored compulsively. So that's where you get the best data and comparing them to placebo because bad things happen to people on vaccine, bad things happen to patients on placebo. So there you have the control group. And we are not in fact finding news and trust me, we would all hear news of bad things happening. And if you hear a case of somebody who died an hour after vaccine, it'll make the news. But at that same moment, 100 people who didn't get the vaccine died. So you have to put all of this into context. And what should you know about the new variants? And this has literally changed as of uh, data I found two hours ago. So where are we today at 7 p.m.? Uh, we are doing horribly. Uh, you'll see the number of deaths is flat, but that's a death rate upon a horrible plateau. Um, hospitalized patients, fortunately, are going down. The number of ICU beds, which in many places, uh, New York in particular, is uh, a metric of when Governor Cuomo will decide to open or close uh, different uh, regions in the, sit in the state, uh, have started to creep down a little bit. Deaths, unfortunately, 
uh, have remained essentially the same in New York and New Jersey. And I just remembered looking at myself in the corner, if my beautiful, brilliant 87 year old Jewish mother is watching this and she sees this little scar, mommy, I had a little tiny benign mole taken off and that's all that is, okay? So stop worrying about it, I'm fine. And I'll call you after the talk. Any case, this is where we are. We're in a terrible place and this speaks to why we all need to be getting our vaccines. How well are we doing in terms of getting vaccinated? The good news is, is whereas, and depends which poll you look at, about 35, 40% of people said they were willing to get vaccinated about a month ago. Now that number is rising. And it's rising because A, there's a feeding frenzy. People who didn't think that this was something they wanted to get see this frenzy about getting it. And B, we're hearing that 32 million people have gotten the vaccine and we are not again seeing hordes of patients hordes of patients, hordes of people uh, getting side effects. And we'll talk about specifically allergy and anaphylaxis and how that, how that pertains to people who've had troubles with vaccines in the past. So let's just look at our neck of the woods. New York, 6.4% of the population has been vaccinated with one dose as of last night. I'm not showing you that map. It was 0.9% had gotten um, two vaccines. I've gotten the full uh, combination of either Pfizer, which is three weeks apart, or Moderna, which is four weeks apart. If you look next door to New Jersey, a little far, a little further behind, not bad, but still, this is pretty uh, uh, abysmal. We're still uh, well under 10% have even gotten their first dose. Um, in fact, interestingly, the state, you might be surprised to find it, that has the highest rate is West Virginia, not usually associated with the most uh, medically sophisticated centers in the country. I'm not saying that in a derogatory way, it's just the fact that this is a state that has a rather low socioeconomic class, perhaps lower medical care uh, around the state than we have in other, what we think are uh, highly touted metropolitan areas. But they have basically found, and there's a very good podcast, um, New York Times has a good podcast on this, they basically found that the way to get it out is to bring it to the small local community pharmacies where you know your pharmacist, you get in there and you get your vaccine. The problem is that people generally don't trust the big ads and they don't trust, let's say, the governors. What they will trust, and this is our obligation as your doctors, uh, is hopefully the people you will listen to the most are your family, your doctors, maybe your rabbi or your priest if they feel strongly about it, but we really feel we are the ambassadors. We are the ones responsible for the, for the health of our communities. I get choked up when I say this. This is very, very important to us. This is probably, in my career, the most important uh, hazard we face and maybe the biggest impact we could have on patients is to convince them to get this vaccine. Now, does that mean it is ultimately gonna be safe? Does that, in everyone, does that mean no one's gonna have a side effect? No, but again, on balance, we're looking at the data and the data suggests that this is remarkably effective, 95% effective. And again, we are not seeing outbreaks of side effects. Can it change? Yes. Can tomorrow there be a hundred deaths in the next patients vaccinated beyond the first 32 million? Of course. Might they happen an hour after the vaccine? Of course. But among another 100,000 people being seen on that given moment, 100 people may die at the exact same moment. So blaming things on the vaccine has to be looked at very carefully. Are these things that make clinical sense? And in fact, are they controlled for? Do we see these same kinds of complications in people who aren't getting the vaccines? Bell's palsy was seen in three patients in the trials, one in placebo. The FDA said this number is not higher than what we would expect in a group of 74,000 people walking down the street. So you have to put all of this into context. So we need to do a lot better. In Israel, in fact, last week, they were the country, actually with the United Arab Emirates, who had the highest percentage of their population vaccinated. It was almost 30% last year. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with they have far more centralized Healthcare systems, everyone in Israel belongs to a semi-private HMO where from top to bottom, it's one unified organization. And months in advance, they had this planned uh, and organized. And, and as you know, it's one of the countries that had the, the most frequent lockdowns, um, but yet they are uh, facing this head on and having very good results. So I put this on, I'm not showing too many slides that I showed last time. Uh, basically what the va vaccine looks like and this is important to know when we talk about some of the uh, misconceptions, honest misconceptions, besides uh, malignant uh, rumors uh, and conspiracies, 
honest misinformation. So this is basically the concept of the vaccine. These are all things that scare people. They see DNA, they think we're messing with your a genetic code. And I'll get back to that. DNA is uh, transcribed into RNA. This goes back to high school bio, which I didn't remember at all either until I had to prepare this lecture, this talk. Uh, RNA happens to be a very, very fragile molecule. So any concerns you have that RNA is gonna, this foreign RNA, it's not foreign from another uh, creature. This is genetically uh, engineered. This is not coming from another human being. This is not coming from other species, this RNA, okay? This RNA is actually very fragile. So it has to be buffered. It has to be packaged into this LMP, which I uh, described as a lipid nanoparticle. mRNA shot into you is gonna, whoa, it's gonna disappear to, in you um, very quickly. So it's packaged in this little fat globule. And that's what keeps it intact until it gets into your cells. When it gets into your cells, the RNA breaks loose. That's translated into these spike proteins, which are on the coronavirus, the COVID virus. And so your body now sees a spike protein, not an intact COVID virus, a spike protein, sees it as far and your body makes antibodies to various parts of that spike protein. That spike protein is not an intact virus. Now your body has all these antibodies that is recognizing that spike protein. And if another virus, a virus comes in, a coronavirus, a real live coronavirus comes in with its spike proteins. Now this is a virus that we are trying to eradicate. We're trying to kill those antibodies, see spike proteins now on top of a coronavirus and kills the coronavirus. Okay. So your vaccine is triggered to make spike proteins. And in the case of Moderna and Pfizer, it's based on RNA that gets into your cells and then produces the spike protein. So how does that RNA vaccine go? Well, it goes into the arm. And I showed this last time. This is the first week, Frida Bernhardt, God bless her, 101, getting it, as we'll see in a minute, phase 1A uh, nursing home patient. And the reason I made this, put this slide up last time is we had the vaccine. This was December 23rd. It was rolled out literally on the 14th, December 14th. So this is a woman who was brave enough to go ahead uh, at age 101. So what are some of the misconceptions, myths and misinformation? Some of them, frankly, malignant. Um, and that could be a whole talk. Actually, I'm doing a, a, a webinar next week purely on that. So there's concerns, very legitimate concerns. This is, this is a vaccine that is actually based on a technology that has not been used in vaccines before. RNA has been used for various vaccines that have not yet been commercialized or for cancer uh, treatment vaccines. But this is the first one that's come to market. And people are also concerned that this was, quote, rushed. This is, in fact, the fastest ever developed vaccine program. How did that happen? Well, scientists around the world, in fact, in many places, dropped what they were doing. The genome, December 31st, 2019, was when the first described case in Wuhan, China. By the beginning of February, it, the, we already had the entire genome and trials for the vaccine were starting within a couple of months after that. Doc, scientists around the world were dropping what they were doing. This was obviously a pandemic that was, that was wiping out people across the world. And the government in the United States had Operation Warp Speed. They dedicated $11 billion in the United States for six different companies, of which Moderna and Pfizer are two, Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca, which are coming next, and I'll touch base on those. Um, were offered this money. Pfizer, in fact, decided not to take the money. They said, we don't want the government looking over our shoulders. Thank you, but we don't need your $2 billion. If we fail in this endeavor, we'll eat $2 billion. Uh, Moderna and the other companies took money. Now, why is that important? Because you have to be incentivized, obviously, to lay out a couple of billion dollars on a product that you don't know will work, number one. Number two, they were able to and encouraged, very much encouraged to start manufacturing drugs before they had any idea whether it would be effective. And it wouldn't be effective, it's gonna go out into the dumpster behind uh, the factory. So we could have drugs ready to ship. The drug, the first one, Pfizer, was approved on December 11th. It got shipped on, the first doses were going into arms on that Monday, December 14th. Now, obviously, we're all hearing about, and we're all very aware uh, suffering from this acute shortage because it's hard to make several hundred millions 
of doses. Remember, there are 330 million Americans. If we were to convince everyone to take the vaccine, that's 660 vials and 606, 660 million syringes. So th this is a large order and, and we're revving it up. Um, and there's political, uh, obviously, pressures to really crank it out, uh, initiating the Defense Act to try and get companies to produce the various pieces of this. Syringes don't grow in the woods either. So everything needs to really get ramped up. And this is where we're suffering. And obviously, there's a lot of pressure to, to move this up. 32 million uh, injections as of yesterday, no signals of toxicity today. And again, tomorrow, this January 29th, we might hear about hundreds of uh, cases. But again, put that into context of 32 million people who didn't receive the vaccine, okay? And there's concerns that this is a live vaccine. It's RNA, the, the, the backbone of life, DNA and RNA. It does not produce anything other than the spike protein. And fortunately, in this sense, RNA is a fragile molecule and it goes away. It gets broken down in the cell very quickly, okay? Now, there's gonna be concerns about uh, the J&J, &J, Johnson & Johnson, and they might, uh, I'm told, and I have zero inside information, uh, be uh, releasing data as early as this weekend or next week, and then the FDA will probably have an advisory board within the first week or two of February. Again, this is uh, things that I read, just as you may. Um, and there you might hear another level of uh, concern and that it is not um, RNA, first of all, it's DNA that's being delivered. That's number one. Number two is, and where people will get most concerned is that the carrier, the vehicle that's driving it into your cells is not this little fat globule. In this case, J&J &J has this adenovirus, which causes the common cold in this, this particular adenovirus, and there are many, causes the common cold and they've re-engineered it so that it no longer does that. And most importantly, it does not replicate. It does not reproduce. And the job of viruses is basically to reproduce, basically by hijacking our own cells. This adenovirus does not reproduce. You are not going to get adenovirus uh, reproducing and causing infection. The adenovirus is purely there to deliver the, in this case, the DNA that again makes the spike protein, releases the spike protein into your bloodstream. Your body makes antibodies to the spike protein. And when a true spike protein comes up on a real coronavirus, it will kill it. AstraZeneca, and here's another, probably my, uh, my, most, fa my most favorite conspiracy theory is that these vaccines will turn, turn you into a chimpanzee. Now, what is the quote, the kernel of truth in that is the adenovirus that AstraZeneca uses, and that will probably be an upcoming vaccine, probably after J&J. &J. That adenovirus comes from a chimpanzee, okay? And that you will not be converted into a ch chimpanzee unless you have great ape-like features to start with. Even then, it's unlikely you'll become a chimpanzee by getting the AstraZeneca virus mediated vaccine that's called the vector and that carries the uh, DNA that then makes the spike protein. Okay, these two are similar in that they are inactivated adenoviruses that will not replicate, will not cause disease and they carry the DNA. Do we know this in millions of people? No, both of these have been studied in about 40 or 40,000 or 30,000 uh, patients. Now an important point I'll make now uh, and I spoke to someone who's uh, very close to Governor Cuomo and could not answer this as of three days ago. Let's say J&J &J comes out this weekend uh, and they get a, uh, and remember, the FDA just wanted 50% effectiveness to approve, it, to approve the vaccine. This 95% just is inconceivable. It's mir truly miraculous. So they were happy with 50%. Let's say J&J &J comes along and I have no idea what the effectiveness is. And I'm waiting to hear as, as avidly as you are. Let's say the effectiveness of J&J &J is 75%. And you got Moderna and Pfizer sitting out here at 95%. And there's just enough vaccines for whoever could get one. And let's say you have your appointment at a make up a place, Jacob Javits Center, all they're offering, the only place that has vaccines for the next month is Jacob Javits and all they have is J&J &J because J&J &J hasn't been released yet. So there are vials, there are vaccines ready to ship and it's only 75%. Are you gonna be forced to take that one? Can you wait for the next one? Should you wait for the next one? These are unanswered questions. The advantage of the J&J &J vaccine 
is that the single vaccine, which in terms of supply and demand, you can get more out because you don't need two vaccines per person. In part, and you hear a lot of criticism that there are a lot of unused vials, I keep calling the vials, vaccine doses on shelves. And that's by design in many cases. When you get your first vaccine in New York State and actually around the country, this has been the mandate. If you're getting your first vaccine, they have to hold your second vaccine dose aside. So you can get the pre-planned second vaccine with Pfizer three weeks later, with Moderna, it's four weeks later. That has just changed and I'll come back to that. But this is one reason there's not as much vaccine as we want. And you've heard this whole debate in Britain, they already started doing it. They said, we're not holding back that second dose. We're gonna give everybody their first dose in the hopes that when three and four weeks later uh, come around, we'll have enough doses to give you. And that's debatable whether that's worthwhile. It's based upon the recognition that after the first dose, about 50% of people are protected. It's not 95, but it's 50. So that's a trade-off. And we're talking about uh, that we, Biden is making these decisions uh, and trying to commit to getting up the uh, number of vaccines week by week. So this comes to adverse events. And I made this point again and again. If you look at, this is the Moderna trial, the Pfizer trial is identical. In blue is the RNA vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, raise the placebo. And if you go across the whole list, first of all, any of these are very uncommon, about one in a thousand, and they're identical. And they're identical between the two groups. Now to speak to side effects, I said there are no side effects. Almost everybody has a side effect. 90% of people in the trials, and presumably in real life also, have some mild side effect. Um, a combination or variety of pain at the site tends to be more common. And all of these, for the uh, sake of the trials, were rated as uh, mild, moderate, severe. And severe, for instance, for pain at a site was that you needed painkillers. And it's recommended you don't take prophylactic Motrin or aspirin or Tylenol because we don't know the effect on vaccine formation. No reason to think it will affect it, but we don't recommend it prophylactically. People have pain at the site. They feel very commonly, people feel uh, low-grade fevers. They feel fluey. I had terrible muscle aches for about all of about 12 hours, and it hurt at the site, uh, feeling fluey. I personally opted to try and get it, if possible, on a Thursday. So if I was laid out for a couple of days, and these symptoms don't tend to go on for more than one to two to three days. Figure that you might feel sort of crappy for a couple of days, but it resolves. And historically, serious vaccine reactions happen within the first few days. And we'll talk about what happens in the first 15 to 30 minutes. So you're gonna hear a lot about phases and this might change by tomorrow morning. And I always welcome what my patients tell me. I talk a lot all day long and I try and listen a lot. And I listen to what my patients are telling me throughout the day because things change throughout the day. And I get uh, updates from patients emailing me. This is the latest um, headline they saw in the New York Post. The New York Post of all places. But about two weeks ago, we changed the phases. So what are the phases? Because this is something you'll be paying attention to, um, maybe, because the states are varying what they do with these phases. Now, these phases are from the CDC. The CDC is the Center for Disease Control. It's out in Atlanta, got a lot of bad press because they got uh, terrific pressure put on them in the last administration. Uh, to be perhaps less than truthful. The FDA approves drugs and vaccines. The CDC for over hundred years has uh, involved in infectious disease epidemics and have made very formal recommendations, recommendations, guidance, not laws, not mandates, based upon an extremely in-depth, sophisticated look at outcomes, risk factors, side effects, ethical uh, allocation of a vaccine. Total of 29 meetings of the world's greatest immunologists, vaccinologists, infectious disease specialists. And they came up with, on December 20th, and they uh, December 10th, they subsequently revised it December 23rd. They revised it as recently as this week. And these were the phases and their guidelines, and their guidelines to be used by the states as they see fit. For the most part, New York, uh, and New York has gone by the book. And that there's no reason to say that going offline is not the right thing to do. Phase 1A, as we all know, nursing homes, other chronic care facilities, and healthcare workers. Phase 1B, which is where we are essentially in New York. New Jersey is sort of 1B slash 1C, based upon what I did, what everybody else is doing, is going online and trying to register. 
1B started out as age over the 75, regardless of whether you had any health conditions or not, and quote, first tier essential workers, which you would imagine are first tier teachers uh, who have in-class teaching, transit workers, cops, firemen, EMS, uh, prison workers, et cetera, et cetera, including uh, people who are front facing in the groceries. I mean, these are people who traditionally also have been uh, people who have been lower socioeconomic classes, less access to health care. So it's thought important to pe put folks like that in 1B. Nobody here has chronic care conditions, chronic care, excuse me, chronic diseases as an indication for their vaccine or drugs. About two weeks ago, Cuomo put in into this phase, which we're in now, age over the 65. You don't have to be 75, you could be a healthy 65 year old, okay? In that headline, it also said, and I didn't listen to the transcript of what Cuomo said, age 65 and immunocompromised. However, having said that, as recently as of 8.05 this morning, and things, actually that's not true, I just went online about an hour ago. In New York, if you were on an immunosuppressive medication, and as many of our patients are with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and this talk was initially uh, to be solely for people with Crohn's and colitis, but as you can see, so much is developing hourly. As of this morning, as of two hours ago, if you went on the New York State site, and I don't need to memorize um, websites, you put in New York State Department of Health uh, COVID vaccine, It'll bring you to a page and there'll be a tab, are you eligible? So I went in and I put in my age, am I a healthcare worker? And I said no to everything. I wanted to see how far down the list I could go. And if you said yes to any of these, they would take you to the page where this is where you can get an appointment. And I kept saying, no, no healthcare worker. No, I'm not a teacher. No, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I kept going down that list and it did not get to a place where it said, do you have a chronic illness? It did not get me to a button that says, do you have an immunocompromised state? Are you on an Im immunocompromised medicine? So if I hit submit, it would say the next thing was, you are not eligible. If I went back up and I put in my age that I'm 65, which I'm not, damn you, then I would go to the next page. And as of two hours ago, I would hit submit, I would get uh, a page where appointments were available. There was a listing throughout the state. So if you guys, and you should go on uh, your site, whether it's New York or New Jersey, if you haven't already gone on today twice, because I tell everyone, go on when you wake up in the morning, go on when you come home from work. So as of about six or seven o'clock, when I looked in all of New York state, there were two places that had appointments available. One was in Plattsburgh, New York, and one was in Potsdam, New York. I Googled, I put Waze on one of them and it was four hours, 28 minutes from where I'm sitting in the office right now. I tell all my patients when I talk to them on the phone, on the video and live, if you got to drive four hours and 28 minutes, drive four hours and 28 minutes. You don't know when your neck's going to be able to get this vaccine. You don't know what the next shortage will be. And I went so far to say, gee, this is great. I'll go to Potsdam. I got, I got plenty of gas in the tank. They don't have an appointment until April 6th. Okay, so hopefully with additional vaccines rolling out and now they're talking about, uh, Biden said they're gonna increase it by 16% a week. The state is being told how much they're getting for the following three weeks. They're not being allocated one week at a time. Hopefully the appointments will get sooner. I tell my patients, just go on and keep clicking until you find the earliest possible appointment. In New Jersey, uh, the same story. Go on, go to New Jersey Department of Health. I went there last night. I don't live in New Jersey. And they did have the question, are you immunocompromised? Are you on an immunosuppressive medication? Do you have chronic diseases? And it then took me to the next page and it told me uh, where in New Jersey uh, had sites. And there were more sites, in fact, open in New Jersey. I didn't go scrolling through uh, what, what the availability was. And again, if you live in Lakewood, New Jersey, and they tell you you got to go to Bergen County, get in the car and drive, take an Uber and get there, get your vaccine. And as it stands now, the policy is if you got your first one, you'll be guaranteed to get the second one. Phase 1C, and this applies to um, many people on the call, and it's chronic conditions that increase the risk of severe outcomes, and that includes obesity. So if you think you're perfectly healthy and an obesity, a BMI of 
30, go on one of the uh, web uh, calculators. You don't got to be too overweight to be a BMI of 30. I'll just toss a coin. I'd say probably 30% of people listening today are a BMI of 30. And I'm only laughing because I'm pushing that BMI myself. Um, that's not that high BMI. That might get you in there. Chronic conditions. I'm not going to necessarily remember everyone. Lung disease, heart disease. Uh, if you've had a transplant, if you have cancer, and they don't say whether you've been cured from cancer two years ago or you're undergoing chemotherapy now, a lot of this is pretty uh, broad. Um, <clears throat> chronic care does not include any of our GI diseases. Severe liver disease, I believe, is on that list. Type 2 diabetes is on that list. Oddly enough, type 2 is listed before type 1. So there are chronic uh, conditions that specifically, and this is not uh, the CDC uh, deciding off the top of their head, these are specific conditions that have been associated with bad outcomes, with greater risk of severe outcomes. Also in 1C though, even though you have Crohn's and colitis or other autoimmune conditions, that doesn't get you on 1C. If you have Crohn's and colitis, you're on um, immunosuppressive medications, the most common, and if you have, you're listening, your family and friends are listening, you're not uh, GI diseases, but let's say you have other diseases for which you're on immunosuppressive drugs and you are perfectly healthy. Let's say you have rheumatoid arthritis and you've been on <coughs> methotrexate, a tiny dose for the last 30 years, you are eligible. If you ask me, <coughs> how do you prove this? How do you prove you had cancer two years ago? I don't know. What we're doing in our practice is uh, if you're eligible because you're on immunosuppressive drug, we have an email, we'll shoot you through the portal within seconds and you can bring that to the state. Um, obviously, <coughs> if you are <coughs> going based on your age, you'll bring something with your age. If you're an essential worker, they're gonna ask you for some kind of ID. If you're working in a grocery or something that else, some other job that you might not have a formal ID, they'll ask you for a, a pay stub. So there's gonna be some documentation, see what they tell you on the website. But again, there's going to be a lot of gray zones. And our medications, and I'll talk about the Crohn's and colitis medications, and in fact, other than steroids and some of our other 6 m azathioprine, the drugs that we might think are the most immunosuppressive, and this again, for you folks who are listening who don't have Crohn's and colitis but are on these drugs for other reasons, the what we call anti-TNF drugs, and they approved for 10 different diseases, they in fact, a little secret, decrease, the good news, decrease the likelihood of a bad outcome. But in fact, you're considered immunosuppressed as far as the CDC is concerned. I promise you, we're not calling the CDC to tell them, hey, by the way, anti-TNF drugs don't increase the risk. They reduce the risk of bad outcomes. You can then get the vaccine. And here, and this is the only time I'll say in this very long, um, garrulous, talkative uh, nature of mine, is to plead with you. Whatever your state says is appropriate for you to go, and that will vary. If it's not your turn, Please don't cut the line. We are unfortunately, tragically, in a state of rationing. This is still a fatal disease. And theoretically, everybody who's healthy and cuts the line and takes a dose is taking it away from that 75-year-old or that 60-year-old with cancer who might end up in an ICU two weeks from now. These are truly life-saving. If you're a healthy 20, 30, 40 year old and you have a way to get the vaccine and it's not your turn, please wait. I'll move on. So pregnancy is an important question. So the CDC, and I put this up, this very um, uh, wordy slide uh, because I wanna be very specific because pregnant patients, we've gotten a bunch of calls, uh, emails over the week since we um, announced we're doing this about pregnancy. And pregnant patients, and in fact, and we'll get to this when we talk about <coughs> Crohn's and colitis, and immunosuppressed patients on all of our meds that we immunosuppress our patients, were excluded from the trials. You couldn't go into the trial. So there's no data. A few patients came into the trials on uh, who became who were unknowingly pregnant or became pregnant between the first and the second of vaccines. A very small number of uh, pregnant women, not enough to draw any conclusions. What is thought to be the case is that pregnant women in general are at greater risk for more severe outcomes and perhaps they're, uh, they're newborns as well. It's not definitive, uh, but that's a concern. So the CDC says that getting vaccinated, and this applies to people, uh, women who are lactate, uh, are, are trying to um, breastfeed. 
is a personal choice for people who are pregnant. People who are pregnant and part of a group recommended, in other words, your turn has come, to receive the vaccine, such as healthcare personnel, may choose to be vaccinated. Conversation between pregnant patients and their clinicians may help them decide whether to get vaccinated with the vaccine that has been authorized for use under the emergency use authorization. These drugs have not, quote, been approved. They're approved under the, what we call this EUA. While conversation with a healthcare provider may be helpful, it is not required. Okay, then put into the considerations. What's the likelihood you might be exposed to SARS-CoV-2? If you essentially haven't left the house in the last year because of a great overabundance of caution, and you say, gee, I really want to see more data, then it's reasonable to wait. No one's forcing you to go. On the other hand, think about it carefully. And we don't have really any uh, significant data on uh, uh, fetal outcomes. But again, it's not a live vaccine. And, and I'm not a gynecologist obstetrician, obviously the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology um, have echoed this uh, 100%. So what are some of the concerns that have arisen? <clears throat> and again, that's why this is basically, as, as we say, a living document. These things are changing all the time. The allergies and the anaphylaxis and the concern. By the time the FDA uh, issued its emergency use authorization on December 10th, uh, Britain had already approved it, and the day before, it had two serious cases of anaphylaxis. We're talking about two out of an entire country who had been vaccinated. Both of those uh, individuals had a history of anaphylaxis. So, who are the absolute contraindications? Being contraindicated, you can't. We strongly recommend you don't take it. Well, there's not that many people, because not that many people have had an allergy or severe anaphylaxis to the first dose. Now, PEG is something called uh, pegylated ethylene glycol. It's one of the many little carriers, chemicals in the vaccine. It's not related to shellfish. It's not related to eggs. It's not related to IV contrast. <clears throat> but if you have anaphylaxis and you know it's to PEG, which I, I, I've never frankly heard of, you won't take the vaccine. <clears throat> if you have, and this is where many of our patients fall, severe allergy to a prior vaccine, an injection of any sort, I mean, people get uh, B12 injections. Fortunately, very few people have allergies to that, any sort of injection or infusions. And many of our patients get biologic drugs as infusions. None of these have overlap in terms of RNA or the vaccine, but the, in terms of the overabundance of caution, the recommendation is not to not get it, but if you get it, rather than waiting the standard 15 minutes of observation after your vaccine, you wait 30 minutes. That's the extent of it. On the other hand, the CDC just sort of put in this new proviso. If you have a history of anaphylaxis to anything else, that's another per, per, uh, group of patients who should exercise precautions. You're gonna go in there, you're gonna wait 30 minutes. Think about, frankly, I would recommend too, if you had a history, truly history of severe anaphylaxis, I would prefer to have it done at a hospital rather than say the Jacob Gravitz Center. But there's very strictly guided uh, regulations about who has been trained to give you the vaccines, et cetera. But frankly, if you had truly severe anaphylaxis, um, I would opt for some place where there are uh, physicians, nurses, you know, people who have dealt with emergent situations. This is new and a, a bit of a surprise. If you have dermal filler, um, for those of you who, and I don't know what parts of your body they might go, I know there's a bunch of places in your face they may go. Um, there have been people who've had local swelling after the vaccine. I'm not sure of the particular chemical reaction. Most of those have resolved fairly quickly, but that's a proportion. And that's been either the Moderna or Pfizer. Whether it will be with the others, I don't know. The other guidance that the FD, uh, excuse me, the CDC has put in there is if you've gotten treated with monoclonal antibodies, and these are antibodies, these are not vaccines. These are antibodies. One is made by Eli Lilly which is a single monoclonal antibody. The other one's made by Regeneron. You might've heard of that one that has a combination of two antibodies. That's what Trump got. Um, they are given very specifically to people who have mild to moderate active COVID vaccine, but not sick enough to be in the hospital. And it's uh, given uh, and monitored as an outpatient. It's thought that A, you probably have protection for three months against COVID uh, reinfection. Remember, you're getting it if you've already been infected. And two, it might interfere with the effect, effectiveness of the vaccine. So hold off for three months if you got the monoclonal antibody. Similarly, if you had plasma treatment in the hospital for more severe COVID, 
the recommendation is A, you're unlikely to get reinfected within three months if you've gotten plasma treatment. And two, we don't know what the effect will be on the effectiveness of the vaccine. So stand back for three months. In fact, this was added since my last, uh, the last webinar we did. If you had COVID, we said earlier that the clinical trials did not ask you, they might have asked, but it was not an exclusion if you had prior COVID infection, or they did not care if you had prior antibodies. You were encouraged to enroll in the study, just like you're now encouraged to get vaccine, even if you've had COVID and you know that you still have antibodies. Now, the uh, CDC has gone so far recently to say, even if you just had COVID and you've gotten over the infection, you have three days where you haven't had fevers, you haven't need Tylenol to keep your fevers down, and you are beyond the quarantine uh, window, you can go and get a vaccine. Having said that, they also suggest you're probably at really low risk of uh, getting reinfected. So at this point in history where there's really uh, limited supply, maybe um, just wait a while. But again, they put it out there and it's not a contraindication. So this is uh, the latest news that's throwing a big scare, very well justified scare <clears throat> into the nation. And uh, there are two that you're going to hear about, and I'm not going to bore you with, with, their, with their new viral variant names. And on the one hand, there are the politically correct that's saying, please, let's not call it the British variant or the South African variant or the Brazilian variant and uh, uh, stigmatize these nations. But no one's going to remember that uh, Britain is B117, and uh, there's another long list of numbers for South Africa or for Brazil or for the next country that comes along with a new variant. The word variant, you might say, gee, does that sound like mutation? A mutation refers generally in this sense as a single mutation. The variants, these are all have multiple mutations. Unfortunately, many of those mutations are involved in the structure of what's called the receptor binding domain, receptor binding domain of the spike protein. In other words, the way the spike protein latches onto our own healthy cells is at that receptor binding area. The receptor binds like a key and a lock to our own cells. That little receptor happens to be called ACE, A-C-E, ACE2. And it's thought that maybe variations in that configuration of that spike protein might make it more contagious. And there's very uh, consistent evidence that the British and probably uh, the South African variant, certainly the British variant, is probably about 50% more contagious, which is a real problem. And that's why we're really trying to rush people to get vaccinated. And hopefully this vaccine will protect against the new variants. We don't know that for sure. What we know so far, and this is as of my reading as of 6 p.m., is that the British variant, um, Pfizer has done a small study taking 20 patients who have gotten the vaccine, taking their serum, and found that in the test tube, at least, it will neutralize the British variant. But that's all of 20 patients. There have also been studies done with serum blood from people who have antibodies, their own antibodies, after having the vaccine, and they seem to neutralize the British variant. Literally, in today's uh, Corona mobile app news that I get from the New York Times, there was a very another small study, but this time on the South African variant, that new, the monoclonal antibodies, for instance, L Eli Lilly and Regeneron, their monoclonal antibodies could not neutralize the South African variant. And there we have a real big problem because then we have uh, basically a, a new virus for which we got to go back to the drawing board. The somewhat reassuring news is that this particular technology, the RNA technology, is designed to basically be able to design newer vaccines rapidly. How quickly they'll have to churn out big studies, we don't know. Maybe they'll just say, you're going to do a few hundred patients, you're going to demonstrate in, in the lab that it works, and we'll get it out. British vac uh, the British variant has now been in at least 20 states. I have no reason to think it won't be in all 50 states. Fortunately, so far, um, there have been no detection of South African variants in the United States. And according to Anthony Fauci, who I say this every time, is what I consider a real national treasure, now so more than ever, where he's been, quote, liberated to speak uh, the truth as often as he likes. He has projected that this new variant may be the most, uh, uh, the British variant may be the most uh, prevalent one as early as March. 
Now, even though the British variant might be more contagious, it's not thought to be more virulent, more lethal, by the very virtue of the fact that more people are going to get infected just by uh, proportions, more patients will end up in hospitals, more patients will die, even if it's not a more virulent, just by driving up the incidence rates. Take home message here, and I, I was screaming from the, the rooftops and I still do, even after getting vaccinated, we still don't know if you're contagious, in fact, okay? We know it present, prevents disease, COVID disease. We don't know if it prevents smaller amounts of infection from which you might not get sick, but you might infect your mom, your dad, your grandmother, your neighbor with chemotherapy, et cetera. So you get vaccinated, you still have to do all of this, particularly if you get vaccinated and perhaps myself included, we're getting a little cocky, I could go about be a little more casual. Well, now there's the British variant to worry about. We cannot let our guard down and everything we know to be effective and truly proven to be effective, we need to continue to do. So more than 20 states, more contagious, but not more aggressive so far. Very small studies, as I just said, using serum from patients with either prior COVID or patients who got the vaccines suggest good pr uh, protection. When I say new data, I literally mean something that was in the newspaper uh, literally two hours ago, not published in any of the med medical literature so far, but just about all the news we get is published first in the New York Times before it appears uh, in our medical literature because it's just too slow to wait for that. So where can you get it? We talked about this. Check the state websites at least twice a day. Travel as far as it takes. Changes in the phase eligibility and the quote rules can change daily. Um, as of this is the 28th. The CDC on January 23rd added this in quote, and this is very uh, diametrically opposed to what was being said until January 23rd. And frankly, I didn't know this until yesterday. In quote, extraordinary circumstances, you can use a different vaccine for the second dose. And this was uh, totally verboten that we, this was something never to do. If you got Vaccinate with Pfizer, you get Pfizer the next time, three weeks later. You got vaccinated with Moderna, you wait four weeks, you get Moderna. And it was basically hard to not do that because wherever you went, you got a, a piece of paper, maybe even an email reminder to show up to get that same vaccine. And they were holding that vaccine, waiting for you three or four weeks later. Apparently, because of concern that we might run out of Pfizer and the only thing that's laying around uh, is Moderna, they're saying, in quote, extraordinary circumstances. Again, they're both mRNA vaccines. On the other hand, we have no data that you can get the other one. By choice, I would definitely still stay with the one you got. They also said you can wait up to six weeks for the second dose. In other words, th uh, three, two or three weeks late. If you listen to the immunologist, which I've been and trying to listen to every webinar at three in the morning, they say at six weeks, they're probably, in other words, two or three weeks late, you're probably not going to run into problems, um, but we just don't know. But ideally, get it within the right time. Um, the take home message, this is a two dose series. It'll take at least two weeks. People say, can I fly? Can I go to the gym? I say, don't count on anything until you've had at least two weeks on board because that's what the study said. Nothing is 100% effective and continue to follow all the guidance we know is effective and don't cut corners, please. So for those of you who have heard enough of me, I'm not sure what time it is. It's probably later than Peter will allow me. Oh my God. Um, we're gonna move on to Crohn's and colitis. Much of this was actually in our first um, talk. There's just a couple of take home messages, but for those of you who are um, here for the vaccine news, we're gonna move on specifically with Crohn's and colitis. Um, it's very easy to summarize the information because um, we had all of this news since March. We're gonna add on, I'm gonna add on the vaccine uh, suggestions, which are brand new. So we know about all these medications that our patients are on. The reason I put them up here because there's a lot of folks who are listening who are not necessarily uh, patients in our practice might have other conditions that are on these uh, drugs. And these drugs are used for multiple indications, and there's no reason to think that the effect of these drugs on the vaccine will be any different if you have Crohn's disease or rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis, et cetera. A very complicated slide, take home message. What is, makes you more likely to have a bad outcome if you have Crohn's and colitis and do get COVID? So let me start by saying, 
all the data we have suggests that if you have Crohn's and Colitis, your risk of getting COVID is not increased. By virtue of having Crohn's and colitis, it's not increased. By virtue of any of the medications you're on, you're not at increased risk of getting COVID with the exception of prednisone in high doses. And that's why right now, if we put someone on prednisone, we're trying very hard to taper them more quickly than before. Furthermore, you'll see here in yellow, what are the risk factors for severe outcomes? So this is one of our uh, former fellows, now faculty at Mount Sinai, a brilliant young kid, anybody under the age, younger than me is a kid, which populates most of the universe. Ryan Ungaro, he, uh, with, with some folks at the University of North Carolina, put together this registry, Secure IBD, and you can go online, just put in on Google Secure IBD or COVID IBD, and it'll bring you to this website, very user-friendly, and it has all the data. Now I think up to 5,000 patients started back in March. Now remember, it is not every patient with Crohn's and colitis in the universe who's developed COVID. So it is subject to some, we call reporting bias, whatever doctors feel like reporting, report it. And probably will tend to report patients who have more severe disease. And that's why you have to take this data with somewhat of a grain of salt. But some of it is obvious. Age, the older the patient is, the more likely they were to have a bad outcome. Um, and the bad outcomes were very clearly defined in the study, very simply, hospitalization, ICU with ventilation, and death. That is bad outcome. Everyone agrees. And like in all the databases, age over the age of 65 was a bad outcome. Systemic steroids, greater than 20 milligrams of prednisone, and multiple comorbidities, multiple other illnesses. The illnesses uh, we would all suspect cardiac disease, lung disease, liver, kidney, et cetera. Smoking and obesity was an independent uh, bad uh, morbidity. And also, interestingly, the 5-ASA misalamine drugs. We're not quite sure what to make of this, and we're not changing therapy based on this. This might be maybe because we're treating older patients more frequently with these drugs. We're not sure if that's the answer. We're not quite sure that this is a real finding. We're certainly not stopping these medications if we think that that's what's keeping you well because God forbid you do flare and do need prednisone, that's the bad actor. So this comes to the question of your immunocompromise on these medications and that gets you into phase 1C. Now you say, gee, 1C, that's, that's, that's no big, you know, that's no big bargain. I'm in 1C, I already had to go through 1A, 1B, here we are, with, we're in January, we're going on two months, and I'm still not near 1C. After 1C comes phase two, or 1D. There, after 1C, there are still about 160 million people waiting to get vaccinated. So being in 1C is advantageous in terms of the time of getting the vaccine. You don't want to have to be on these medications, unfortunately, but they will get you higher on the list. We do know that Certain immunocompromising conditions, specifically prednisone, maybe HIV increases the risk for severe disease. And in fact, maybe pregnancy, maybe. We don't know the safety and effectiveness because these people were uh, excluded from the trials, but we're not excluding them from getting the vaccines. You should know, we don't know, and I keep repeating this, we don't know the safety and effectiveness in, in groups of people on medications that suppress your immune system. But again, I made this point again and again for this reason, these are not live vaccines. On the other hand, we are hoping with these vaccines to build an immune response so your body makes antibodies. Might these immunosuppressive drugs block your body's ability to make the desired immune response, the desired antibodies? And the answer is, we don't know. So then you'll ask the next question, for those of you on biologic drugs, you know how much we pay attention to drug levels. You'll say, gee, should I wait for my vaccine when I expect my drug level to be the lowest? Let's say I take Remicade every eight weeks. Should I wait to the eighth week right before I get my next dose to get vaccinated? The answer is, we don't have data on that one way or the other. And right now, a dosing is so precious, don't take a chance. Don't wait for the next six weeks. When you get a dose, take it. Might you need more down the road? We just don't know. Right now, you get dosed and vaccinated like everybody else. Okay, this is basically the same slide. So, should receive non-live COVID vaccine. Why do I bring this up? Because this is what's on the plate now and in the near future and for a while. mRNA vaccines, again, 
that is the uh, um, that is the Pfizer and the Moderna, <clears throat> the non-replicating adenovirus uh, vectors. Again, they're they are not replicating viruses, so you don't consider it a live vaccine from which you can get infected. DNA vaccines and protein vaccines, which are probably the next to come along in Europe and the United States, are okay as well. They're not live vaccines. There are what we call live attenuated vaccines in China. I think they've already sold them uh, to India and maybe other parts of the world uh, that are viruses that are alive, but attenuated, weakened, much like measles, mumps, rubella. Those are live vaccines. So just like we tell all our patients on immunosuppressive meds, you can't get measles, mumps, or rubella vaccines, you wouldn't take an attenuated live vaccine that can replicate. I find it extraordinarily unlikely that we're going to be seeing those vaccines because God willing, we're going to be able to ramp up production of these vaccines you see here, which are non-live or if they are live, non-replicating. So again, to summarize, IBD is not listed as a CDC high risk to put you into 1C, but then again, you are in quote, to use the uh, CDC words, on immune weakening drug. No drug is a contraindication to COVID vaccine. We do, however, if we can, again, try and tape you down on the prednisone because besides being a bad risk factor, maybe will impair your ability to mount an appropriate immune response. And again, don't try and time it to where you are in your cycle. So the take home message is, and then we'll take questions. IBD patients are not a greater risk for COVID infection unless you're on steroids. IBD patients not at a greater risk of a severe outcome if on an anti-TNF, Stelera or Antivio probably also both reduce the risk of bad outcomes. So we certainly don't stop it, hoping that it, it would um, uh, increase. We don't stop it while you don't have uh, COVID. If you do have COVID, right now we do hold it, not based on a lot of data that says it makes sense. We do hold it. And then once you're well, we try and time it as soon as possible to get you your medication. Increased risk of severe outcomes if on steroids or perhaps uh, 6-MP or azathioprine as well. Um, and since these drugs uh, are in your system for quite some time, if we want to stop them, this is probably not a bad time to stop them. Uh, remember, if you're on these immunosuppressants, you're called promoted to 1C. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't be there and get the vaccines as soon as possible. So with that, I wrap it up. Not as incredibly late as I was last time, Dr. Lignani, and because <laughs> I'm gonna have to hear about this for the next six months. It's painful. Um, so Peter, take it away. Uh, fantastic presentation, Dr. Cormo, thank you. Uh, a number of questions specifically regarding autoimmune diseases. Uh, yeah. and of the 90 questions that were asked, at least half pertain specifically to autoimmune diseases. They come under three uh, parts of it. One, how do we know that the vaccine is safe for people with autoimmune diseases if it really wasn't studied? And with that, why should people with autoimmune diseases get the vaccine now instead of waiting? Okay, so if you look on the CDC, in the papers that were published, and I presented this data last time, they did list the sort of large categories of diseases, cardiac, pulmonary, et cetera. And those people responded as well to the vaccines as others and without increased side effects. Autoimmune diseases, quote unquote, autoimmune diseases. And the, uh, the FDA, the CDC in fact, has a list of autoimmune diseases of which there are 80 and Crohn's and colitis are part of that. Autoimmune disease, people with autoimmune diseases were allowed into the study. And according to the CDC page without citing any data, of those 74,000 patients, there was no increased risk of side effects. I have no, no idea whatsoever, I don't think anyone does, of how many patients with Crohn's or colitis, um, which are presumably the, the highest number of autoimmune disease that we have people listening tonight, um, were in the study and whether they had more, uh, more likely to have bad outcomes or less likely in fact to have the benefit because they might not mount an appropriate immune response. The short answer is we don't know. Um, it is a non-live vaccine. Uh, if we listen to our immunologists and our vaccinologists, they don't think having these autoimmune diseases per se put you at higher risk. We don't know the effectiveness. We don't know uh, in terms of, are they gonna be as effective if you're on an immunosuppressant drug for an autoimmune disease? 
But what we do know, and we don't have biological plausibility for any of that to be bad news, but we do know is the rates are still very high. They've been rising. There's a variant here. And we know that even healthy young people can get very sick. If you are a healthy young person and maintaining an overabundance of caution and are on steroids and have a chronic autoimmune disease and have a low likelihood of having a bad outcome if you do get COVID, I think it's perfectly reasonable to sit and wait. It's a matter of weighing risk and benefit and your own sense of risk aversion and risk tolerance to the vaccine and to getting the illness. Follow up to that. Are people with autoimmune diseases advised to avoid the Moderna vaccine. There have been uh, a number of questions suggesting that they have heard or read that people with autoimmune conditions should get the Pfizer vaccine or wait for the J&J vaccine. Comment on that, please. Um, I'm just not aware of that data. I, it might be right. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm just not aware of it. Part of this, I think, goes- And if whoever wrote that in, if they could send you um, a reference, I'd love to read about it so I'm, I'm better informed next time. Exactly. Part of this is that there's so much that's being written about this um, that is not entirely verified that things proliferate exactly as you said with the, the New York Post articles, etc. within there. Um, mechanistic questions about where IBD puts us within the vaccine queue. You touched on this in the uh, presentation, but even after that point, we're still getting a number of questions about this. Uh, and specifically, there are people who are not part of our practice or are seeing um, also gastroenterologists from other practices who are specifically told that Crohn's and colitis is a condition that puts them in and of itself into the higher category. Can you comment okay. on that? All right, so th that we do have data on and we have a lot of data. Crohn's and colitis does not put you at increased risk. We put together, there was an international organization of IBD um, experts from around the world and in early March, every Monday, every Friday morning, 8 a.m., there would be a huge conference call because 8 a.m., you weren't messing with anybody's sleep if you were in Melbourne or, or Hong Kong. And we sort of made the prediction that Crohn's and colitis won't increase the risk. And that was purely an educated guess. We could have been dead wrong. It turns out there is now very good data um, from very large databases. You could tap into insurance databases with over 40 million people in these databases. And in there, Every patient, everybody walks in the door has a diagnostic code. So then look in these 40 million, this database of 40 million patients, take the diagnostic code for everybody with Crohn's and colitis, take the diagnostic code for everyone with COVID, and you see what percentage. Then take everyone who doesn't have Crohn's and colitis and has COVID, the percentages are the same. Then throw in into that combination, the two codes, throw in the mix of what medications you're on. And that's how we know the anti-TNAS, Remicade, Umira, Stelaire, and Tibio don't increase the risk of getting it, okay? We have no data when we look at this, what we call the secure uh, database we were talking about or other databases specifically of Crohn's and colitis patients that they have a worse outcome per se. If you're older, if you have multiple comorbidities, if you're on prednisone, even 6 mp nazithioprine, you do. The disease itself does not impart a greater risk of getting it or of having a more severe course if you do. The questions particularly pertain, though, to where in the queue, in terms of the underlying condition, having IBD would put you. So would having IBD put you alone into category 1C? No. So <sighs> something just happened to my screen. I don't know. But <clears throat> in any case, the short answer is no. There's the CDC, and you go, you could get this is all very user friendly. It's meant for non physicians. Um, although, if you're more interested, they give you references, you go to the actual uh, medical publications. <clears throat> if you go to CDC um, vaccine, COVID vaccine allocation, it'll bring you to the page. And they're very clear that um, what diseases, I could have made a slide, put you there. They say they actually have a paragraph autoimmune conditions were not excluded from the study and can get the vaccine. And from what little we know, they didn't have worse outcomes. But the take home message is it does not um, exclude you from getting the vaccine. It does not put you into group 1C. If you are on an immunosuppressant medication, yes, you are in 1C and you could get it. Now in New Jersey, there is a checkbox if you are on an immunosuppressant uh, medication and you'll get called sooner than if you're not. But that too might've changed since uh, earlier today. And just to clarify, 
the mesalamine medications, the Pintasa, Lialda class of medicines are not immunosuppressant medications. Yeah, correct. And that's why we're very puzzled as if that's a real finding that if you're on these medications, it increases the risk of a bad outcome. We're not sure that's real. Again, the, the patients that are sent into this, this registry are not necessarily representative of the global population of all kinds of IBD patients. And it might just represent that by and large, the people who are submitting uh, information to the database are submitting probably sicker patients. If I have a patient who comes in, they're 19 years old, and they say, yeah, by the way, uh, six months ago, uh, I had COVID and I had sniffles for two days, or I just had positive antibodies. I am probably less likely to put them in the registry uh, than someone who's very sick. So we're not sure that that really represents a, the broad global universe of our patients. And, and from the, the people asking questions, I think it's important that Stellara, Humira, Mercaptopurine, azathioprine, et cetera, would be considered the immunosuppressant medications for the New Jersey, Connecticut, et cetera, state checkboxes. Whereas the mesalamine class, Pentasa, Lialda, et cetera, would not be considered a immunosuppressant medication. That, that, that's something to be clarified. Further questions. People who are taking a injectable or infusion medication, specifically Humira, Remicade, Stellara, uh, Simsia, um, Intivio, et cetera, when should they get the vaccine in relation to their dose? Again, that's a great question. <laughs> and we're very mindful that we think uh, having an adequate level of the drug, and as you know, many folks here, we've increased your dose or your frequency of taking it because we want a higher level. You say, gee, I'll be more immune, uh, suppressed. I'm less likely to make an appropriate immune response. The answer is yes, but the same organization of IOIBD, this international group, it's literally, I'm not sure it's public information, but it's, it's gonna be published very soon. The strong recommendation is we don't, until we have information otherwise, that you're better off waiting, get the vaccine when you can. Don't worry about when you had it. If you had Umira this morning and you got a call that your vaccine is available today, go get it. What might be a little <laughs> offsetting is that they'll tell you uh, in the CDC webpage, and when you go to get your vaccine, did you get the flu vaccine or did you get any vaccine in the last two weeks? And if you did, they say you can't get it. I got the, I happen to have, uh, I'm going, you know, I'll go public here. I got the flu vaccine seven days before I got uh, my COVID vaccine. I went, I had no idea they were going to ask me. They said, did you get the, uh, any vaccine seven days ago? And I'd gotten the flu vaccine at CVS a week before. And I said, um, 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 no, I didn't. Because, and in fact, though, our patients who we urge them to get their annual flu vaccine, it's still flu season. We tell our patients, please get your flu vaccine. Did you get a pneumonia booster shot? Now I'm telling them, until you get your vaccines on board, wait a while, because in case you come there and you tell the truth and you've taken your flu vaccine, your pneumonia vaccine, they'll say, wait 14 days. I don't want anyone to lose their spot online who is ready for their spot online because they got the flu or the pneumonia vaccine. That's my own personal opinion. Next question. Why are we recommending people who have gotten COVID and who likely have antibodies or have a blood test that shows they have antibodies, why should they get the vaccine now? Why shouldn't they wait to get the vaccine in three months or six months? Okay, so that, that's really a great, very, um, well, all these questions are great, very valid questions. But that's a question I think is, is very reasonable to answer, makes sense to maybe wait. We do know this. There are now have been, uh, in the United States at least, I believe, and I might be off, about 25 million people who have been infected with COVID. I might have that number off, but I think it's the ballpark. Since early March, by end of February, beginning of March. We hear on the news, if someone's reinfected, it makes the news. And so we're talking about 25 million people. If 1% of 25 million people have it, that would be 250,000 people, if I'm doing my risk. We don't see reinfections, and presumably it's because we still maintain antibodies, whether you measure for them or not. So the thinking is, is that you have antibodies, you're probably protected. At what level? Because some of these assays, some of these antibody tests will give you a level or, just, or some will just say positive or negative. We don't know what level you need to be immune. And we don't know long how, how long those antibodies are protective of getting reinfected. 
my impression based upon just looking around us, we're not seeing reinfections, even in people who are infected in March and April for the most part. So presumably the antibodies are protective out now for about eight months. Can they be protective at nine months and 10 months? Maybe not. So we're telling people get the vaccine. If you are, and I'm not faulting this, if you are by nature risk averse to this concept of a brand new vaccine, I can't fault you one bit to say, let's wait for a couple of months. There'll be plenty of vaccine, hopefully in a couple of months. You won't have to wait online anyway um, and take it then. Because you probably, especially if you're recently infected, are probably okay. Probably. For now. So further questions on immunosuppressants. We know about the injectable immunosuppressants. How about people who are taking the oral ones? Mercaptopurine, azathioprine, uh, Zeljans, Celsept, et cetera. Does it matter okay. if they hold the um, dose or a few, a few days before or after the vaccine to try to make it more effective? Will the vaccine uh, be less effective in them because of these oral, more broadly um, based immunosuppressants? So a great question. The answer is we really don't know. Uh, 6 mp azathioprine, stopping it, you know, the effect of 6 mp azathioprine probably lasts a couple of months. We know when we start on 6 mp azathioprine, we generally think it's going to take a couple of months to work. When we stop it, it, we think, well, you probably have protective benefit. Even if the drug is out of you in two or three days, the biological effect is probably there for quite some time. Um, if we're thinking of stopping 6 mp azathioprine anyway, this is probably a good time because the more recent research, we didn't know this with the first few hundred patients on 6-MP or azathioprine who get COVID. If you get COVID with 6-MP and azathioprine, you probably do have a greater likelihood of a bad outcome. That doesn't translate, however, into this question of should you stop the medication? The answer is if you need to be on the medication, take the medication. We don't know the likelihood will impair the effectiveness on the vaccine on the one hand, versus the likelihood you're gonna trigger a flare by being off your medication. So the current recommendation is don't stop your medication. When you, when you could get the vaccine, get it. It's important to know that a lot of these questions are actually planned to be answered within specific research studies. Effectiveness, how uh, people will generate antibodies and maintain responses when you're on immunosuppressants, when you have IBD, et cetera. There are actually studies that are gonna be looked at for this. But I think we all need to remember that this disease has only been around for a year. So we have to take everything with our wanting to know and understand that this is still very, very, very early in our understanding of the disease, our responses to the vaccines, et cetera. A few more really- uh, So let me just follow up on that. We are probably going to, with the larger group at Mount Sinai and all of us at New York Astro, are gonna participate in studies where, especially in our Crohn's and colitis patients, who have an immune disease and might be on immunodeficient immuno, uh, drugs that suppress your immune system, asking you to participate in studies where we will ask to draw antibodies at predetermined times, perhaps before and certainly after the vaccine. So if you get called, we'd love for you to help answer these questions that, that Peter just talked about. Exactly. Uh, uh, one last question, and I think we've uh, spent enough time uh, on this this evening. After the vaccination, after we've gotten our second dose of the vaccination, when can we begin to go to somebody else's house, whether they've had the vaccine or not? When can we begin to live more normally and be less afraid of this disease and the consequences of it? When Anthony Fauci says it's time to take off our masks, that's when we take off our masks. This too is, a, this is not a static playing field we have here. The variant might be throwing a, a whole new wrench into this. The prediction was, and this is, again, I want to clarify it because I, I want to make sure you don't hear this and in, 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 it's twisted in the wrong way. The concept of herd immunity. Herd immunity, It's and I just read for the first time this weekend, there's an immunologist who's a bit of a purist. It's not really herd immunity. Your herd, H-E-R-D, like a herd of cows, the herd of humanity is not immune. It's herd protection. And the thinking is that if about 70% of the population has immunity by either hopefully vaccination and not by live infection, when about 70% of the population is protected or immune, the remaining 30% are less likely to get it because there are fewer and fewer and fewer people there to infect them. And gradually the epidemic dies out. That's how 1918 flu pandemic 
which was an H1N1, not this kind of vaccine, after killing 50 million people in the world, with, and the world was a much smaller population, it died out because most of the, many of the world had died out. That's what it took to get herd immunity. God willing, we're gonna get there much quicker with the vaccination. Having said that, if you have a new variant where the reproducibility of that is much higher, it might take more than 70%. And just to clarify a term you're gonna hear so you know how to interpret it, you'll hear what's called the uh, R naught. If you see it in the paper, it's R with a little zero. That basically just is the reproduce, re reproduction efficiency of a infection. In other words, it tells you an R of one, an R naught of one tells you if you're infected, you will infect one other person and the epidemic will keep going. If, you, if there is for a given vac, uh, virus an R naught of two, for every person that gets infected, you're going to infect two other people. And that epidemic is just going to grow and grow and grow. If the R naught starts to be less than one, and this is something you'll read in the New York Times, and this is something Cuomo will pay attention to, let's say it's 0.5. So gradually, fewer and fewer and fewer people will become infected and the epidemic will die out. The higher the R naught, the more people will have to be immune before it's safe to come out. I, I can't fathom that it'll be for, again, I know nothing. I mean, I'm just listening to what Fauci says. And frankly, I think he's been somewhat optimistic to say by late summer, early fall, that we'll all have our masks off. But I think, God willing, there'll be enough vaccine, enough of us will take it, the variant won't have taken over, and life will start returning to normal. But this, the take home message here is you've gotten your both vaccines. It's two weeks later. You can't take off your mask. You can't run around like this never happened. That, that's super important. The better the virus is controlled, the less transmissible it is, the virus will develop less variants because there won't be as much reproduction. So it's really key at this time to get the vaccine and to keep wearing the masks and to keep staying vigilant within that. Otherwise, it takes longer and longer for us to get out of this uh, vicious, vicious cycle that we're in. I'd like to thank everybody for their attention. I'd like to thank Dr. Kornbluth. This has been the third of a incredibly timely and really uh, high level presentation that have been done. Uh, and we'd also like to thank all of you for posting their questions. Uh, I could tell you from reading the questions, we have a lot of incredibly intelligent and thoughtful people asking a, a number of very provocative questions. We've tried to get to as many of them as we could in the presentation. One last reminder that in about a week or a week and a half, this presentation will be posted on our website. So I would check toward the end of next week, and then you can look back and see if there is anything else that you want to read, uh, listen to again within this presentation. So for this, I, on behalf of Dr. And Cole, a plug, Peter, a plug for the next one, which will, will happily not be about vaccine, but how uh, to better handle your nutrition, your microbiome. Tamara Freuman, F-R-E-U-M-A-N. Look her up on Amazon. Buy her books even before the webinar. She's absolutely terrific. Many of you might have seen her. Um, February 10th at 8 p.m. You'll get, you'll get an email in advance, and you won't have to look at these two ugly mugs. Uh, agree. Well, no, actually, we'll get Peter and me both off the camera. It is an absolute superstar. Have a good night, everybody. Thank good you. Good night, everyone. Thank you for dialing in.